We're going to get started here. So my name is David Campanella. I'm the research manager for the Parkland Institute. Uh, so welcome everybody. We've got a, this is the Creating Corporate U session. And as Chris Hedges mentioned uh, last night, if you were lucky enough to be there, the deteriorating integrity of our universities is a very troubling trend that crosses the, uh, crosses the border. And so we have two fantastic speakers to talk more on that topic today. We will, um, each speaker will have 20 minutes. So I'll introduce each speaker before they come up. And we're a little, running a little late, so we'll get right to it. Our first speaker is Judy Garber. Judy is an associate professor of political science at the University of Alberta, where she teaches, writes, and does public speaking about cities, law, and US politics. She's on the editorial board of Urban Affairs Review. And in her research, Judy is interested in public space, in its political qualities, how it is defined, and how it is shaped by gender and sex. She is currently writing on the legal influences on the Occupy movement, Occupy movement's use of property in Canadian cities, in Canadian cities, and on the implication of U.S. cities in the war on terrorism. So, without further ado, Judy Garber. Or, since I'm interested in words, as I would put it, the war on terrorism. Um, my talk today uh, is entitled Signs, Narratives, and Truths, the New Vocabulary of Public Universities in Alberta. And um, I'm really happy to be here today, and I um, thank Trevor for inviting me to, um, to speak at this conference. Um, and also, I'm really happy to meet uh, uh, Rob Sutherland, who will be presenting after me, um, but kind of scared to hear what he has to say, given the, the, the bit I read of the report um, that, you'll be, that you'll be speaking about. What's in a name? Well, I just got this from Wikipedia, by the way. Um, in May of 2012, when Alison Redford announced her new cabinet, she announced the appointment of MLA Stephen Kahn to be Minister of the newly renamed Ministry of Enterprise and Advanced Education. And I thought that I was the only person in Alberta who took notice of this name. Um, certainly, I heard no universities saying, hmm, that doesn't bode well for us. Um, and it really was more or less a non-issue, this change from advanced education and technology, which makes a lot of sense given that we have two fine, large um, institutes of, of technology um, in our post-secondary system in Alberta to enterprise and advanced education. Like, really? They couldn't even have named it advanced education and enterprise? Um, now, I, I just, you know, traced, I was interested to go back and see what the names had been previously. And of course, traditionally, it was, the ministry was called advanced education. Uh, advanced education and career, career development, learning for a little bit of time. But I mean, this is, this is a big change. This is a meaningful change in a name. And names and words have meanings. So nobody should have been surprised at what happened less than a year later when the minister um, eviscerated the funding for uh, Alberta's post-secondary uh, institutions and rewrote the, the, the story through language and through symbols um, of what a university is. 
Um, I did, I did want to give a shout out, I don't know if you can see this very well, to the one per, I'm not sure who posted this, it may, might have been Carolyn Sale in the English department here. This is kind of the critical, the, this is the, the forum for people who are critical of everything that's happening at the university um, to vent. And whoever posted this on this blog, Art Squared, um, it was a Carolyn. It was Carolyn, yeah, that's what I figured. Um, that she noticed that the Edmonton Journal um, had a headline to an article I can't get at anymore. Um, and the title said, Rookie MLA Stephen Kahn, who is from St. Alberta, um, a suburb of Edmonton, uh, to Captain Enterprise Portfolio. And she notes, Carolyn, that they didn't need to mention the advanced education part, although she didn't actually criticize the fact that Enterprise was even in there or that it was first. Um, words matter. Um, and I'm going to play this. Oh, I wasn't supposed to do that. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm not doing that. Canada, nope. in many ways, is a nope. wonderful country. We've been very blessed. No. Nope. Okay. This is what I want to do. First of all, I think it's important for me to say again, as, as I think you're very clear on, that it is law enforcement agencies, including uh, obviously the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, CSIS and others, but particularly the RCMP, that make decisions on operational police matters. And obviously they have worked very closely with their American counterparts. And uh, I, uh, I congratulate them for that work uh, once again. Look. Um, I think that uh, in terms of radicalization, this is obviously something we follow. Uh, our security agencies work with uh, each other and with others around the globe uh, to track people who are threats to Canada and to watch uh, uh, threats that may evolve. Um, I, I think though we, uh, you know, this is not a time to commit sociology, if I can use uh, an expression. It, to use an expression that he just made up. Okay, now, this went viral on Facebook, which is the only social medium that I use. Um, committing sociology. Okay, well, words matter. They reflect ideas, values, interests, and many other things. They create ideas, values, and interests. They create ideas more for the purposes of what I want to say today. They create ideas, they create narratives or discourses or stories, in this case about universities. And in a sense they create truths. They do create reality, especially if the words seem commonsensical, you know, that well-known phrase, commit sociology. <laughs> the vocabulary of attacks on public institutions of higher education um, is both particular to Alberta, but also quite globalized. However, I want to point out something that I actually believe. Words, narratives, and truths are contestable. And one of the problems that I find with the way in which the, the, the words and the, and the stories that are, you know, being, being told um, and are being pushed as dominant with respect to universities in Alberta, universities everywhere, um, one of the problems I see is that there's not enough contestation from people who might make a difference, including um, the people who work in universities, certainly, oh, sorry, I'm supposed to be covering up the microphone, um, in, and certainly the, um, the people who lead universities, um, students, faculty, media, I think there's not enough contestation um, against the, the kind of push to change how we talk and think and, and visualize uh, what a university is. Now, 
I'm going to use a very, very, very simplistic version of um, a linguistic um, term and a linguistic theory that is more complicated than I um, than I understand. But I want to use this term because um, it's it's actually in this really cool textbook that I was using, or this book I was using in my class, written by a criminologist at the University of Toronto named Mariana Valverde, who is an amazing, amazing person. And um, she, we're talking about crime and narratives about crime in my class. Um, but she she talks about signs, um, and signs are units of meaning that are found in words, whether those words are written, whether they're spoken, or whether they're omitted. Signs are units of meaning that are found in images, whether those are photos, or maps, or drawings, or logos, um, or sounds in, in one's tone of voice, in, in music. Um, they're found everywhere. We find meaning, we make meaning, in signs, in individual signs, and how we put them together and how we position them relative to each other. So I want to argue that we're moving in our, in the way we talk about advanced education in Alberta or the way the um, Deputy, Minister, uh, Deputy Premier talks about it. We're moving from signs to narratives to truths or to efforts to create truths. So this, this process of gaining meaning, the meaning of a word or a phrase or a symbol or whatever gains acceptance and authority through repetition, through emphasis, through enforcement, um, say through fiat and through lack of critique. And the example that I want to use first is Campus Alberta. And I don't want to assume that everyone here is from Alberta, um, but I don't want to belabor this point. Um, Campus Alberta is the, uh, the Minister of Enterprise and uh, Advanced Education's vision, and, and also previous ministers and previous governments, vision of <coughs> a system of post-secondary education that is um, controlled by the province. And unlike, say, the University of California uh, system, which encompasses many amazing universities or other university systems in other states that are formally governed and where you know, there is a structure for all these institutions to, you know, have a say in what's going on. Um, in the Campus Alberta is just this notion about how the province can control universities and what universities and, and other post-secondary institutions and what they do. It's a brand. It's a method of control, it's a brand, it's a slogan, it's a message that we are to be kept in line. And in the draft um, mandate statement, mandate statement, that was sent to the University of Alberta in the spring from the Minister of Enterprise and Advanced Education, um, the province helpfully notes that the U of A agrees to focus its resources on following areas, one of which is actively engaging in promoting the Campus Alberta brand, including the use of the Campus Alberta logo on all institutional correspondence. Um, now, the minister, uh, two weeks ago, when he suddenly found all this money that didn't exist previously to give back to universities where people had spent thousands and thousands of uncompensated hours trying to find ways to cut that spending for the money that was just suddenly given back. 
um, he, re he, he retracted the mandate that Campus Alberta branding be used on all of our stationery. So I went looking for the Campus Alberta logo. And so I Googled, as, as one would, Campus Alberta logo, and I find all of these different logos. And this is, you might say, oh, that's the Campus Alberta logo. No, that's eCampus Alberta, which has existed for 10 years. So I'm looking and looking, where the hell is the Campus Alberta logo? And this was also circulating on the internet. That's that same eCampus Alberta logo. I don't know who produced this, but it's meant to be Blake, I believe. I believe it's meant to be William Blake and the like circles of, maybe it's Dante. Maybe it's meant to be the Inferno. I don't know, either Blake or Dante. Anyway, circles of hell. There's the Minister of Enterprise and Advanced Education. So I'm thinking, okay, that's the logo. And then I went back to the end of that last sentence in the in the mandate letter and the the next sentence is the logo and guidelines for their use will be provided in the near future there isn't even a logo or a brand this is just someone's idea it's an ideology that doesn't even you know that that essentially has no substance and i think this is control for control's sake or representation of control for control's sake. Now, um, so signs turn into discourses in when they're put together. And in this draft letter of expectation, um, the mission of the University of Alberta, part of Campus Alberta, does not, th these are not their words, I'm saying, I read the four pages, only three of which are substantive, one of which is procedural, One of, there's a signing page as well. And there aren't very many words on these pages. They just get to the same words, enterprise and, and business and economy get used, oh, and Campus Alberta get used over and over and over again. It's like a, a detailed outline. So not that many words. But in this entire mandate letter, the word teaching, the word teachers, the word professor, doesn't exist anywhere, anywhere in the document. Okay, that's meaning. Okay, it's and it's part of a discourse. So how do we know there's a new discourse? I hope you can read this. I hope it's not too small. Um, well, we know there's a new discourse because when we read this mandate letter in the three substantive pages, the word learner, learners, or learning is used 13 times. The word student or students is used three times. The word student or students are used three times. Once in the phrase employers and students, and once in the phrase faculty and students, which is the only reference to professors, faculty, teachers, instructors at all in the document. So the word learners and learning suggest, now this comes out of a kind of critical pedagogy that rightfully um, attempts to distance itself from professors speaking the truth to the uneducated board masses. Okay, I have some agreements with this pedagogy, some disagreements with it. But in this case, it's used not in a progressive way. It's used kind of in an economic way. Um, it's used to suggest that learners and learning are kind of free floating. And these are words that I actually found. It's about mobility, it's about transferability, it's about distance, learning occurring at a distance. It's about seamless, seamless pathways through which learners can move about among the interchangeable parts of Campus Alberta. It goes well beyond classes, classrooms, classmates, or campuses the way we think of campuses. Those are words that are not class, classrooms, classmates, campus, in the way we think about, never used in the mandate. And learning, um, enterprise and advanced education learning within that context 
could and should be about acquiring any kind of knowledge or skills through post-secondary, and this is a quote from the mandate letter, programs and services that the university provides. So it could be parking services or it could be philosophy courses. Who knows? Um, the word training is used a lot and very oddly it's used in the context of Aboriginal learners. And there's something very unsettling about the fact that Aboriginal learners who are mentioned once, and I think it's something like in other disadvantaged groups, are, are, you know, are to be, you know, sent into training rather than, you know, learning semiotics in a linguistics class. There, there's a very odd connotation there. And certainly, as is mentioned many times, external stakeholders to the university, primarily government and businesses, should be consulted, um, employers and students, in um, shaping the kinds of knowledge and skills and training that the learners are learning. Where the learning is coming from, the source of what is being learned is totally unstated. That's a narrative about what a university is. No professors, no classes. Students, on the other hand, are probably have teachers. They may even have professors. They form relationships with particular professors who are not infinitely interchangeable, with TAs, with colleagues, with, with non-academic staff. They might examine physical materials in books or bones or, or chemicals. Um, they might share spaces that are special, that are unlike the spaces of home or work or recreation or, or commerce. And when we think about students in that narrative, students could or should be developing ideas, ideals, ways of thinking or being in the world through uniquely post-secondary curricula or courses that scholar teachers, scholar educators find pedagogically sound and useful, that we argue about and that we shift as appropriate. Learning involves human intervention. I am out of time, but I am going to point to my one last um, very important slide, which is the truth. The truth of the University of Alberta, actually I have other slides after this, but they're about this. The truth of the University of Alberta, if you go on the University of Alberta website, is that the massive uh, open online course, Dino 101, who is being that is being taught by the amazing Phil Curry, is the most important thing to know about the University of Alberta. It is on virtually every page that the home page links to. Um, it is on the home page, and that symbol with those words and that image, so this logo, the only other words, logo, image, sign that appears on the University of Alberta website more frequently than Dino 101 with the Dino is the University of Alberta, is the University of Alberta's own logo. And if you go in and explore what this free course is all about, this massively expensive undertaking, then you'll um, get a, a sense of, of, um, of why I think this is important. Um, and thank you for uh, hearing me out. Is that on? That was a fascinating analysis, Jiri. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, that was really interesting to hear how they've, the government's co-opted the progressive language too and sort of manipulated it into their, their own political interests. And I wonder if that's not a conscious effort because it's not the first time I've come across that. In my own research, I've seen that 
certainly in, uh, in the seniors' care as well. So interesting threads to possibly pull. So our next speaker is Robert Sutherland. He is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of Lethbridge, and he is currently the president of the Confederation of Alberta Faculty Associations. And his presentation is called No Commercial Potential, Innovation Without Profit. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to thank um, Trevor Harrison and the Parkland uh, Institute for organizing this event and for inviting me to participate, um, participate in it. I really appreciate it. Um, I find I'm going to be talking primarily um, about one word uh, for at least the first part of my talk, and that is money. Um, if we take a look at the way governments and other institutions um, apportion their budgets, they are expressing how much they value different aspects of activities that um, they're engaged in. So money and, and, um, and budget lines express core values. Uh, and so if, here's one graph that I think is uh, interesting. Uh, and this has to do with um, gross expenditures on uh, research and development in Canada. <clears throat> and there's a couple of things I'd like to draw your attention to. First is that funding for research is going down in Canada, but more dramatically in recent years, uh, funding by businesses, so expenditures by businesses on research and development um, is going down even faster, and, and even faster as a proportion of the wealth being created in Canada. So businesses withdrawing funding. Um, and Canada does very, very poorly. If you take a look at uh, business expenditures on research and development as a proportion of GDP in Canada, we are uh, lagging way, way behind other countries covered by the OECD statistics. Uh, so uh, only Luxembourg, for example, uh, has had a bigger decline than Canada in the extent to which business is spending money on research and development. And this isn't due to the economic slowdown. Uh, if you take a look at the average of OECD uh, countries, uh, it's fairly stable, as is the business expenditures in the United States as a proportion of GDP, at the same time as uh, Canadian business expenditures on research and development are declining sharply. It's even worse in Alberta. Uh, Alberta businesses are, are making money um, at an ever-increasing rate, but yet business expenditures on research and development in Alberta are actually far lower than the Canadian average and very, very low relative to other countries that are actively engaged in research and development. This brings us to the fact that um, there's a change in funding that's taken place in Alberta. Um, there's a massive funding cut to the universities. And the deputy premier and minister has said many, many things over the months since this uh, funding cut was announced. But I want to focus on a couple of things that he said, because I think he may have told the truth once. <laughs> the minister explained that the deep funding cut was necessary. He called it an enabler to secure the cooperation of post-secondary institutions in building a new look post-secondary system. The universities must more closely align to the government's business-oriented agenda, a recipe for change that Lukashik says is non-negotiable. This is what he has in mind, that universities will be contributing far more commercializable research. Um, they've said many other things uh, since the budget was announced, since this enabling uh, budget cut. Uh, for example, universities need to learn how to earn money uh, or that we have to change our relationship to our copyright and patent, to our intellectual property, to the things that we produce uh, as academic workers. Why is this happening? One idea that I'm going to assert is that um, this is part of an overall plan in Canada 
to move public funding and resources out of universities and independent research centers to pay for commercialization activities that businesses are unwilling to pay for in Canada. It's as simple as that. They're taking money from us and getting us to contribute to commercialization activities that businesses don't want to do in Canada. So let's look at some of the consequences of this. Um, and I'll share a couple of worries that I have uh, about this process. One has to do with um, dramatically unbalanced uh, funding portfolios for different kinds of research and scholarly activities. And the other has to do with academic integrity. So there are lots of different models of funding different elements of scholarly activity um, in government. The one that Lukashik and Redford seem to have in mind is A, a linear model. Lukashik talks about this linear model uh, over and over again, where you have basic research, then uh, that goes to application and development of products and finally production of products. There's this linear track that he has in mind, and, and many uh, uh, government policy experts have this model in mind. It separates basic research from the uh, activities that go on in the economy uh, by a good stretch, and must be very frustrating uh, for him. Um, instead, more uh, modern models of research funding include the what's called the Pasteur quadrant uh, analysis, where we have purely commercialization uh, activities, development of new products exemplified by somebody like Thomas Edison. In contrast, in this quadrant, you have the activities of Niels Bohr, which have no commercial potential whatever, or it certainly didn't at the time he did them. Um, we now do have um, uh, quantum computing capacities. Uh, and then you have this interesting part of the quadrant here where Pasteur sits. Uh, these are uh, fundamental basic discipline driven research activities that have some use in mind um, at some point. So not purely to understand, but to understand in order to enable some uh, public good to emerge. Um, and many people uh, have a very similar model here in um, what is called a three sector model where you have use inspired research corresponding to Pasteur's quadrant uh, basic research, and then this kind of R&D work that uh, is done in industry. It's extremely important to realize, though, that the amount of fundamental or discipline-driven research that needs to be done for any particular application um, is uh, huge. Uh, there's a fantastic amount of work that goes on in terms of uh, hypothesis development, theorizing, um, experimentation, data collection, epidemiology, surveys, modeling, and the like. Far more of that has to go on for any given little bit of this um, scholarly activity to emerge above the surface into contributing in some important way to a product or to some um, advance in health or social policy. So what about the recent claim that Alberta needs to fund more applied research? That is research with an immediate economic impact. Um, this year, I examined the funding portfolios of all of the Alberta Innovates uh, uh, um, corporations. These are the uh, parts of the Alberta uh, system that directly fund research. Um, and so we have Alberta Innovates, Health Solutions, Biosolutions, and Technology uh, Futures. And if you take a look at what they actually fund, for example, take a look at Alberta Innovates Health Solutions, which has now um, come under health services and is no longer part of advanced education. Um, arguably, as I look through all of the funded uh, components here, arguably they're all applied research. There really isn't any basic biomedical research funded by this organization anymore. Nothing that's really discipline driven. Uh, it's all collaborative to develop trans translational um, products that um, have a three-year time horizon in the majority of cases. Um, if you take a look at <clears throat> um, biosolutions, um, I'm not going to belabor all the programs, but they have three priority areas that they fund. 
One is advancing the bioeconomy, which is largely directly related to uh, improving products in agribusiness. Um, they have uh, quality food for health as a second priority, which in large part uh, has to do with uh, manipulating uh, animals to produce leaner or heavier carcasses. Uh, and they have prion and protein misfolding diseases as a third priority, which is directly related to uh, bovine spongiform encephalitis, or mad cow. Um, I would argue these are all applied research. There isn't any uh, discipline-driven research or any fundamental research um, funded by this group at all. And Tech Futures is exactly the same. All of their work is directed towards uh, economic and social well-being with the emphasis on commercialization of technology and the application, the direct application of knowledge. So trans translational research uh, with some kind of commercial potential. So I actually think that um, it's difficult to, de to defend the claim that um, uh, there's not enough applied research being done. In fact, the evidence that I have is that we have a completely unbalanced model of funding in this province. Uh, nearly all of it going to applied research and translational research. Um, often um, we hear claims that the federal government's actually involved in funding the discipline-driven or basic research. Uh, but in fact, uh, if we look at their uh, funding decisions, the National Research Council of Canada, which was an exemplary independent research council, uh, has been more or less gutted. Uh, and it is now a concierge service. It is more or less a telephone number that people with business ideas and so forth can phone up to be linked up to researchers who are willing to work with them. Uh, that's what the National Research Council of Canada has become. If we take a look at the funding uh, to SHRC, NSERC, and CIHR, all of these have gone significantly down um, over the past five years. Uh, there's absolutely no good news. If you take a look at the amount of research in, in uh, councils like NSERC, which is really uh, has been the core of basic funding in the natural sciences and engineering. If you take a look at discipline-driven versus fettered or targeted research um, funding, uh, the profile is going uh, in favor of fettered or targeted uh, research, not discipline or basic, uh, discipline-driven or basic research. Also in NSERC, this is the council I know best, um, you can see that the funding rates have gone down uh, rather dramatically, 62% um, versus 73%. But look at the funding rates for CIHR and SHRC as well. Uh, the funding rates, that is the proportion of applications received that are funded, has gone dramatically down. At a time when other indicators indicate the Canadian research quality is going up. In contrast to that, this is an interesting program that NSER created. It's called the ENGAGE program. Um, it is directly to support short-term research and development projects aimed at addressing a company-specific problem. The success rate in this program is 90%. So if you want to almost guarantee that you'll be funded, hook up with a company and solve one of their problems for them. And the funding for this program has gone up rather dramatically uh, in the recent past, directly in contrast to the basic or discipline-driven councils. So what? Um, but both the province and the feds are reading from exactly the same playbook. They're moving funding and resources to partnerships with industry and other end users. Um, we can't deny that there is some benefit uh, that uh, accrues to this kind of funding. Um, but we're acutely aware with the loss of funding for basic scholarly activity that there's a cost. Are there any other costs associated with this. And one of the uh, key costs was first identified in a US study where 10 university uh, agreements, research agreements collaborating with uh, big oil companies were examined for the extent to which the universities preserved their core academic values. That is, did they put into the agreements the various things that we would consider to be essential academic values? And the answer is they did not. So when universities enter into these agreements to 
learning how to earn money from uh, industries. In fact, nine out of the 10 agreements fail to retain academic control over the governing body that directs the partnership. Four out of the 10 gave the industry sponsors full governance. That is, no academic control. Eight out of 10 permit the corporate sponsor sponsors to fully evaluate and control the research proposals. Not one of the 10 had peer review as part of the decision making. Nine of the 10 agreements had no specific manage, management at all of conflicts of interest uh, involved in these agreements. Um, as a result of that, the AAUP and CAUT uh, came up with a set of principles to guide institutions in uh, setting up these kinds of uh, agreements. Um, these are some of the uh, more important principles. Uh, academic decisions involving academic staff, including hiring, priorities, approval of proposals, and so forth, should be retained by the academics. Uh, and there should be peer review. There shouldn't be interference unnecessarily with the publication of knowledge uh, related to the collaboration. Uh, guarding the integrity of the educational curriculum, conflict of interest provision should be there, and there should be transparency associated with these agreements. This month, CAUT published their analysis of 12 agreements that were established between Canadian universities and uh, private partners or private donors. Uh, and the results are rather interesting. They simply applied these agreed upon uh, academic principles to each of the agreements. Um, here are the 12. Uh, they involve uh, universities all across Canada, including a couple in uh, Alberta. And what did they find when they looked through them? Were the agreements public? That's the number, that's the proportion that was actually in the public domain. They're all secret agreements. Uh, it's still unclear even to what extent these were known uh, within the universities themselves. Um, uh, for example, what, were the agreements all made available to the Board of Governors? Um, did the agreements protect academic freedom? The majority do not. Was there a requirement for disclosure of conflict of interest um, in these agreements? The vast majority no. Did the university retain autonomy over its own activities? Only half. Was there a requirement for academics and administrators to reveal whether they had a financial interest in the partner? The vast majority, no. Was there a guarantee of a right to publish in the agreement? The vast majority, no. Was the funding peer reviewed? most cases not. Do the actual faculty members, students, and postdocs involved in the research, do they have access to the data that were collected on the projects they were involved in? In the majority of cases, no. But this is no threat, according to the Deputy Premier. I don't know what a threat would look like um, if this isn't one. The general points that I'd like to make, it's very clear that administrators, um, the general faculty councils, the boards, and the governments are not consistent in preserving our academic integrity. It, it appears, uh, at least on first reading of this document, that universities are entering into agreements that may violate their own policies, their own collective agreements, and try council ethical requirements. Okay. Why this matters is that within the university, it's absolutely important if we're to generate activity that is uh, publicly needed and useful, we have to consider all disciplines, and including interdisciplinary work, as well as research in emerging new disciplines. We have to value the entangling of our research into uh, our educational activities. We have to recognize the full range of basic, applied, and practice-based research. And we have to consider the diverse ways in which research results are, can be disseminated. 
Furthermore, we have to value the social, economic, environmental, and cultural benefits, not simply some narrow uh, commercial profit. And it matters because <clears throat> um, really our scholarly activity at universities animates the education. It provides opportunities for students to participate in good research. It models reasoning and, and discipline use of evidence. Um, it, uh, it is the case that better educated people generate more wealth. They have fewer social problems. They access social programs less. They're healthier. They're more flexible in the case of social and economic change. Um, and understanding natural and cultural processes will definitely enable new environmental health and social solutions, contributing to the public good, not just to corporate, corporate profits. So let me summarize. <clears throat> um, research activity in universities is diverse, and the valuing process must reflect that fact. It's clear that we have an unbalanced funding portfolio, and there are high risks there. We're squandering the long-term capacity in our universities, and we're chasing away talent from Alberta. Administrations and boards are inconsistent in preserving our academic integrity. And likely, the only people who are going to preserve academic integrity in the universities are the academic staff and the students. And the opposition is mounting. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. That was quite the one-two punch. Uh, so we have just over 20 minutes for questions, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of interest. So a few ground rules. We want to hear from as many people as possible, so if people could keep their comments or questions brief, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, please keep them also on topic as much as possible. Uh, we're going to prioritize um, people who haven't spoken yet. And we're also going to try to balance sex, age, and race. Uh, so, questions, please. First one here. Three brief, brief comments I'd like to make. Uh, one is uh, that we should uh, start to talk about Harper committing uh, economism. Uh, I think that might help. Um, I was listening to CBC yesterday on um, 180, and uh, there was a representative from Monsanto uh, speaking, and the um, the radio person uh, challenged her about, uh, well, you know, is GMO safe? And she says, well, there's all kinds of studies that show it. And she said, uh, many of these studies are university studies. What she didn't say is how many of the university studies were financed by Monsanto, which seems to me to be very likely in this kind of situation. And the third thing I'd like to say is just that I used to live in Thomas Lukasik's writing, and when Bill 11 was being discussed, I went to talk to him, and I suggested we should have a um, um, open meeting in the in the writing, and he said something like, "Why should I do that? Then I'd just be open to having all kinds of groups like the Raging Grannies come and and." make their, their points. So, so anyways, that's the kind of stuff we're dealing with. Thanks. Um, my question is, how can we get the University of Alberta to be back to its original roots of Henry Marshall Tory saying for the uplifting of the entire people because it's not currently I think currently I think vocational training for business as Chris Hedges put it yesterday would be an accurate summary of a vast majority of the university but I think just as background I think I want to say that in some ways I disagree with the presentation when we vilify Lukasik or we heap scorn on the provincial government and say that they're the ones controlling the university. I don't think it's that simple. I think there's the university, there's parts of the university that is controlling the university. And the corporatization is not just being driven by 
outside corporations or the province. I think it's driven by parts of the university. Talking about the university monolithically is a vast misunderstanding. Different faculty have different needs, students have different needs, graduate students, the administration. So personally, myself, just as background, when I was at the university, I, ran, I was the Students' Union president for one year. I sat on the Board of Governors. I got to meet some of the people on that board. Uh, people like Mr. Saville that donated a lot of money. People like Mr. Jerry Prady, he was the uh, founder of the CAPP, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. These people are not uh, exactly academic integrity champions. And I think uh, when, we, when we talk about why is the university being corporatized, we have to talk about, well, why, let's ask things like, is, is not Indira's head office, the president of the university downtown at the Hudson's Bay Building instead of on campus anymore? Or, or any kind of, what about, about arts funding? Why were we in the PCL forum or the PCL fora, foyer for the reception last night? All of these things, this is not an outside force. There are, there are parts within the university. So I'm curious, what do we do to take the university back to its original mandate when forces okay. within the university? Are Thank you very much. Let's hear um, some responses. Judy, do you want to? Respond and I will respond uh, first because I'm at the U of A. But um, are are you Mike Udima? No. no, sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, wasn't wasn't going there. Just wasn't sure uh, which activist SG president you were. Um, <clears throat> certainly, yes, obviously. Um, and given more time to bloviate, I would have started picking on, uh, even in the, if I had gotten to my last slide about the dino course, I would have, you know, started picking on particular, um, you know, parts of the university on particular people. Totally true. But, I mean, one of my points was there has to be pushback. And, you know, the people in power don't push back. And I believe that, I don't know what the president actually thinks, what, what Indira Summersaker actually thinks. I don't know what her actual values are. Um, I think she's going with the flow. Um, I believe that from observation, I do not know him, that our acting provost, actively agrees with the direction that the government would like us to take. That's what I'll say. Okay, uh, one of the things that I hope you did not hear me say that uh, I identify and consider myself to be the same as um, the, all parts of the university uh, be, because I don't believe that. And, and so I think that um, the fact that administrations enter into agreements of the sort that are well described in the CAUT uh, report indicates that they are certainly not acting in the interests that you're uh, describing, uh, that you embrace. Um, th they are definitely not. What I would recommend is that um, the kinds of pressure and pushback that can be created involve organizations. Um, the organizations that exist on campuses already uh, need to become motivated to make academic integrity a key piece of what they do, not just fees and tuition, for example, um, or not just salaries um, and pensions. Rather, uh, the integrity of the institutions that we work in and study in uh, has to be one of the key values that our organizations put forward. Next question. Uh, at the back there with the red turtleneck. Thank you. Um, given our ongoing discussion from last night about creating broad-based movements of resistance to fascism, let's just use that, um, and taking 
creating the corporate you as a part of that broad-based social movement. What's your take on um, possible collaboration between tenured professors, academics, um, and their associations in that broader based um, movement of resistance? An isolated um, corporate you style, if you like. I will say that the Confederation of Alberta Faculty Associations is extremely interested in working together with student and other staff associations, um, other employee unions and, uh, and associations on the basis of defending the core values of, uh, of the academy. Uh, very interested. We have done this in the past. Um, and uh, I hope that that becomes a more important activity going in the future. So um, occasionally um, there are wedges, uh, for example, the provincial government knows how to drive wedges between students and faculty. Um, uh, they very clearly and cynically did that uh, by talking about tuition in the way they did. Uh, and I think that um, uh, needs to be acknowledged that the collaborative activities in opposing some of these changes need to be based on principles and not simply tuition, fees, and salary. Next question in the middle here. Um, hi there. Thank you for, very much for your talk today. It's super interesting. Um, I'm really concerned about the new $25 million donation to the newly named Workland School of Education in Calgary. And I'm wondering if you can comment on the potential consequences of an education faculty um, being sort of owned by um, an ex-oil executive and what the consequences this might have for teaching of our future generations, but also how you fight the expectations that money buys versus what might be best for the common good. I haven't seen that agreement. Um, and I don't know that anyone has. Um, presumably, uh, whoever signed on behalf of the university read it before they signed it. Um, but why, why not ask to see it? We don't know what it contains. Um, the University of Calgary, to my knowledge, is a public institution. We fund it. Um, our, our government is supposed to direct it um, uh, through the Board of Governors and through uh, General Faculties Council. And these organizations should see the agreements that are being signed. So uh, in principle, there's nothing wrong with um, someone giving $25 million for the university to engage in its, uh, its own mission. Um, so money in and of itself in that regard is not uh, the problem. The problem is when university administrations sign over their own integrity to um, private partners. That's the problem. And, and unless people at Calgary know what's in the agreement, it's very difficult to know what you're opposing. Inquire. Um, I would wonder at least why no enterprising reporter at the Calgary Herald has asked that question. <laughs> Someone over here had a question right at the beginning. This gentleman uh, in the third row. Um, yeah, first of all, I was wondering if you could put the last slide up again. It has nothing to do with the question. I just wanted to take a photograph of the quote. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, part of the critique was uh, at the beginning was that uh, education is a human, uh, requires human inter intervention. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment uh, as to whether there was anything good coming out of this uh, uh, some of the proposals having to do with the uh, uh, the use of technology to enhance that human intervention. Uh, I supervise students around the world and uh, have been quite capable of doing it uh, at a distance. And you're asking me, yes. Um, and it's the problem isn't distance education, which is 
I mean, one of the problems is that Athabasca is, Athabasca University is so under attack from the government, as far as I can tell. Um, it's, if that's, that still involves human interaction. That involves you, a person, who should get to get named or acknowledged in, you know, officially as part of the learning that goes on. The technology is a supplement to you. You are not a supplement to the technology in, in, in my view. So the fact of distance learning is, is very important for a lot of people, but that's not what the, that's not what the narrative is. The narrative is that it's all about, that there's nothing special about you, that there's nothing special about the courses you oversee, and that it's all interchangeable. Um, so I endorse the use of te technology. I didn't get to say what I thought the problem was with MOOCs, because that's another, that's another big issue. I think even MOOCs can be uh, useful, but not, they're not going to be, that's not, they have a promise that will not be fulfilled. They'll be taken in another direction. But when I read the University of Alberta's um, mandate letter and the word professor never exists, the word teaching never exists, the word teacher never exists, but cloud server is in there, <laughs> then we're, we've gone way beyond the value of distance education and the way in which technology can be used in the classroom. So I didn't mean to insult you. Um, I'm sorry if I did. Um, I, I greatly value my colleagues at Athabasca and, um, and what you do. Oh, and also who aren't at Athabasca. <laughs> Do you mind defining MOOCs for everybody in the room quickly? Yeah. Massive open online course. And they're, they're video, they're internet courses taught by amazing people who will attract tens of thousands of paying or non-paying students, depending on what access they want and whether they want credit or not credit. Dino 101 is actually being taught in conjunction with a classroom course by Phil Curry. Um, but the, the objective of the MOOC is eventually to charge um, and to create a kind of star system where you put a ton of money into the production values. And you should go on, this course is cool. It's really cool. Um, but to put a ton of money into these things, get your big superstars with your sexiest topics. And there are companies who, who for-profit companies whose you know, have invented this idea and it's about charging. It's about universities becoming profit centers. Um, so this Dino 101 is cool because people can access it for free and it's Phil Curry and it's great. But the amount of resources they put into this thing at the same time that even the Faculty of Science in which this course is offered is unable to teach us students um, and where graduate students, funding for graduate students in the Faculty of Arts was slashed by 20%, that's a new narrative about what the university is. Sorry for my students who don't have TAs and my grad students, but this MOOC is cool. Thank you. Uh, so there's a woman in the back with the black vest on. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was just, I was at the event last night, um, Chris Hedges and a faculty member um, 
said at one point to me, um, I think we should go on strike. So I said, well, gee, it's illegal to go on strike. She said, well, but we can kind of work to rule. Uh, we can teach our courses and we cannot do, and then we don't do anything beyond that. And I actually am at the point where, as a faculty member here, I'm in a department which is ranked internationally one of the top two uh, in, at the University of Alberta in the world. And, and, and we suffered a 20% loss of faculty in this uh, voluntary severance uh, that was done in order to account for the missing millions that Lukasik took away and then miraculously later it reappeared. So what's happening is the university is being restructured externally by these arbitrary funding ups and downs, but internally the administration is restructuring so that only certain faculties have resources. They happen to be, I don't know, business, engineering, who knows, uh, but they are not a, a full-fledged uh, university functioning apparatus that's going to deliver an, 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 a broad education to students. And, uh, you know, like other faculty and students, we went to the legislature a number of times. I sat in the legislature. I went to meetings with Lukasik where he was uh, displaying his budget. I've written letters, etc. cetera. Um, and, and so I'm just wondering if you, as uh, faculty members and, and, uh, and as head of the um, Alberta Faculty Association, if you could address that, like, is that a possibility? I mean, if we're talking about academic integrity, and if we're also talking about a functioning university, and, and what we value is being destroyed um, as we are uh, beginning or ending our careers, then, then what is to be done? I don't know, maybe this is something we really should seriously address. Well, I think there, there are definitely activities that large numbers of people can engage in short of strike that could be extremely effective. Um, so uh, that would include working with your uh, staff association, the academic staff association. Um, uh, many people have looked at staff associations and faculty associations in the past and, uh, and judge what um, a faculty association can do only by looking at what it's done. But I think with people moving into association activities, I think there's um, huge potential. Uh, there aren't very many other organizations within universities that faculty members can exert control. Um, my read of GFCs and Senates across Canada is that their agenda is almost entirely set, not completely, but almost entirely set by administrations, as is the agenda of Board of Governors. Um, and so really the only countervailing force you have is through associating yourself with other faculty members. Um, in respect to uh, strike, if a faculty association has not collectively agreed to give up the right to strike, then one legal opinion is that they retain that right. Time for maybe one more question. Um, <laughs> Okay, yeah, maybe we could fit in two if we're really, really quick. Uh, gentleman up there in the sweater, and then we'll come back down here. Yes, I am from Athabasca University, and I appreciate the, the comments uh, because we have been battered uh, severely as an institution. Um, my question, though, has related to the, the corporate funding of universities. And the question I have is, what do universities really get out of it? If you fund researchers, and they say 10 researchers, and give them 3 million, what is the university getting out of it, unless there's some other type of return on, say, overhead costs or other type of funding? Because it doesn't seem rational simply to accept corporate funding unless there's another sweetener in it. And what about the downside? If you're trying to attract top graduate students, the best in the world, and you're more or less a corporate harlot, how are you going to attract anybody that's worthwhile as a graduate student? So it has to do with the intake of also uh, uh, a student's and the reputational hit that the university would have. You think anybody with a thinking cap would realize there's real downsides to the institution if you're only just taking corporate money and you're not getting out anything else on the side? I'm just going to speak really briefly because I know Rob knows way more about this than I do. Um, universities do get a cut. 
Um, and sometimes they get a really big cut. They don't have to pay for professors or graduate students or staff that they might otherwise have to. It is very attractive to some graduate students, especially because those some graduate students may be making whopping amounts of money um, for a graduate student or for like anybody. Um, and because it's prestige, a lot of it is about prestige. A lot of what happens in, come on Jay, you, but you're an academic. What do we've got? We've got prestige. That's a lot of what is, that's a lot of the capital of a university. I think in the long run, there will be a loss of um, academic credibility in signing agreements. And I will say again, people should try to get a copy of the agreements and actually read what's in them because there's a lot of money for uh, administrators, for uh, renovations, for um, students, for postdoctoral fellows, and faculty lines are paid for. So it is a way of improving the financial uh, prospect of any academic unit to bring in private money. Um, the key thing, though, in terms of preserving what reputation um, institutions have in Alberta is actually in signing agreements that defend the basic academic mission of our institutions. That's the key. For most of the existence of capitalism, um, the point of reference for humanity has been pretty clear. Uh, mostly 99% was the uh, point of production. Um, 1% uh, the point of exploiter. Um, now that narrative has kind of shifted um, to the point of um, consumer and it's permeated the uh, um, the academic sphere too. I've only heard once in the both talks um, academic worker. Do we need to get back to the understanding of a student as a member of the working class, an academic worker? And how do we do that? So, so I'll just, if, if you don't mind, I'll uh, quickly say, I mean, I think that one of the most important um, uh, values to a university education was to, um, to raise up the, the common good. Uh, and, and I think there was an understanding, certainly going back uh, into the 1950s, that higher education uh, was an extremely important driver of economic prosperity, uh, social change, um, uh, improvements in, in health and, and social institutions and so forth. Um, and I think that uh, driving the narrative towards the idea of simple consumers, students are characterized sometimes as uh, stakeholders or investors um, and so forth, loses the uh, original uh, impetus for uh, many people to be sending, many families to send their children to university. And that is to uh, raise up their families and uh, produce this uh, ripple of improvement in, uh, in the common good. Fantastic. Well, uh, I hate to cut the question and uh, the discussion session short, but we do have Lots to get to today, so just a few brief announcements. Uh, lunch is served immediately following this session in the lower level of the North Lecture Theatres, which is outside the lower doors of the big room we were just in. You, if you purchase lunch with your registration, there will be a happy face stamp on your name tag. Leftovers will be sold by donation starting at 12.45. We'd also like to remind you of this evening's reading of Arno Kopecki's new book, the Oil Man and the Sea, Navigating the Northern Gateway. The event starts at 7 o'clock tonight in Dewey's Lounge in the Old Power Plant. 